Let's talk about the refrigeration cycle of a YCIV and YVAA system. So I'm going to do an initial run through right here with the equipment in front of us and then I'm going to go back and I will uh, do an actual drawing of what I'm referring to later to try to get a little bit deeper explanation as to what exactly is we're looking at here. So our different components are from the compressor. We come out the compressor discharge over there. We come up on this line right here and hit the oil separator. Okay, So the oil separator comes in, acts like a moisture trap on regular piping. So the hot gas comes in mixed with the oil, the vapors and all hit the side of the uh, separator. The solid oils fall down into the bottom of the sump where they come out of this line back to the compressor. And then the gas, the uh, the uh, the purified vapor with the oil removed, not completely, but uh, c considerably taken out, then comes up on these lines and hits the coils. So there is a, this is a V style coil inner and outer. It's why you see two lines. Anyway, so we come through, come through the condenser coils, and then we come back out the bottom right here of the condenser coils into the liquid line liquid line comes down runs through the dryer and then he hits the feed valve okay so this is known as the feed valve this is a stage one of the two-phase side of the system so we're we're high pressure liquid refrigerant and right here we transition to two-phase and we begin to go into low pressure so from the two-phase valve we come up this line and go into this tank here. Now this cylinder is also known as the uh, flash tank. So it is part of the low side of the system. Its job is to flash off that refrigerant. So much like a centrifugal has, you know, the train centrifugals have the economizer set up with flash plates. Well this is a little more, this is York spin off of that for an air cooled design. So what they're doing is the, the two-phase refrigerant comes in, it hits the vapor of the, of the initial flash, collects at the top of the tank, and the subcooled liquid that was left over falls to the bottom. Out the top of this, kind of, hard, kind of dark in here, but out the top of this, there is the economizer line that comes off, and that goes back to the economizer valve and port on the compressor. I'll get into that more later. So the, the vapor gets flashed off, gets pulled off the top of the tank and pulled back into the suction end of the compressor. And all these, the uh, subcooled liquid then falls to the bottom of the tank where it gets pushed through uh, this, what is known as the drain line into the drain valve. So this here is your drain valve coming into your evaporator. Let me get a better angle here. So coming into the evaporator, Going through the evaporator, this is a DX barrel. Okay, so you have two types of barrels. You have flooded and DX. This is a DX barrel. We know that because the refrigerant comes into the end bell and the water comes into the side of the housing. All right, that means the water is on the barrel side. Inside the tubes inside the barrel is the refrigerant. Uh, if the refrigerant was coming in and hitting where these water pipes are and the water pipes were coming in hitting the end bell then we would know that it's the other way around it'd be known as a flooded barrel we come through the drain line and into the into the evaporator and this is basically the final flash point now in it technically it's this isn't truly flashing as much as it is just allowing that literally what is what is called you know the drain valve is it's literally just kind of letting that tank drain off the already flashed in low pressure refrigerant uh, I, there is some additional pressure drop and loss across this valve but a majority of it happens there at the initial flash point at the feeder valve so we go through the evaporator come back out the evaporator through the suction line and into the compressor and back through the cycle we go again that's your basic function. This is specifically on a YCIV. So the YVAA has some additional piping that the adductor line pulls off of. Now I'll cover more of the adductor side here shortly. 
let's finish up with this. So this is the economizer valve coming in. This valve will be closed at initial startup. And after the unit has come on and run for a few minutes, it will then, uh, this, this valve will be energized and it will open up and feed into the backside of the screws. Now keep in mind, the compressor may be this long, but the actual compressor itself doesn't start until right here towards the, the very end of the compressor. This whole backside is just strictly the motor. Your screws are from here to here, and, the, and all the rest of this is part of the screw assembly. It's your oil system, it's your discharge line, it's your muffler, uh, again, your economizer coming in. This is your oil inlet coming through there. And that's coming off of that oil separator. From the main panel, you can see these different readings. So we're gonna come to system one data and we're gonna cycle down until we get to all right right there so economizer solenoid is off that is that uh, valve i was referring to and showing you uh, like i said this is going to be off for the first few minutes of the cycle and then that will turn on and when that turns on that's when it starts to pull that flash gas off the top of the flash tank uh, again the, the flash tank is an economizer and it is acting as an economizer there's a little bit different shot this is a liquid level sensor that's monitoring the liquid level inside the economizer. And that is also displayed up here. That's what that valve is. We continue to cycle, see so flash tank level. So right now it's at a 34% level inside of the flash tank. And that is what is controlling the feed valve percentage, right? So that feed valve gets open and closed based off of how much level is inside of the uh, the flash tank itself and you cycle over suction superheat is what is controlling the drain valve all right so depending on the superheat coming back into the compressor is going to depend on what that drain valve opens and closes to and so each of those valves are looking at those two different metrics to decide okay do i need to feed more feed less and so forth and the whole system has an algorithm that balances uh the, the refrigerant flow through the cycle otherwise if if those valves start having issues these numbers can start to get really erratic because the valves not controlling properly and it will overfeed the the evaporator or it'll get to the point where it will start to uh, overfill or underfill the flash tank and you'll start having issues on the feed side as well a common issue is I have had several of these valves uh, on the YCIV, specifically the YVAAs have not had the same issue. The YCIVs are a older model. Anyway, uh, the drain valve specifically begins to have issues and it will not uh, dr uh, control the superheat properly. And usually what I see is I'll see it overfeed and cause the suction superheat to be down too low now once this su suction superheat gets below i believe it's uh around two to three degrees that it will cycle itself off on low suction su superheat and kill compressor operation it's something to be aware of you know that that's going to be one of the safeties you're going to struggle with if you start having a charge issue uh, a common sign to a charge issue is the the flash tank level will be really low and the feed valve percent open will be very high. So that's another indicator that, okay, we've got a refrigerant issue going on here is, is the flash tank is, is too low. You know, it's reading maybe just a couple of percent at most, you know, it's not, it does not much in there. And the feed valve is, is say 75 to hundred percent open. That's the basic view from an in-person perspective. Now what I'll do from here, is I'll take some shots and I'm going to go down and actually put some pen to paper and I will draw the rest of this circuit out and I'll also kind of explain the difference on the adductor side and how that changed and how that impacts the system as a whole. So I've drawn up a basic mock-up of the refrigeration cycle. This is a YCIV specifically. Uh, we will get deeper into the YVAA and what changes were made for that series. Regardless, You've got your compressor here, so you're going to come through the out the compressor discharge, 
this line, you're going to hit a muffler. Okay, it's just a standard muffler like we'd put on any compressor. It's nothing truly fancy. You're going to go through the muffler into the oil separator. Now, in the bottom of the oil separator, this is going to be your oil line returning back to the top side of the compressor. Uh, and that's just this is the extent of your oil management system. There will be some oil that does escape, and that was one of the things that this system does have is has a high potential of allowing migration and the oil not always returning quite like it's supposed to especially when you're having charge issues so just something to be aware of and you have to watch real closely with the ycv system is your oil levels and making sure they maintain coming out of the oil separator you come out you go into the condenser through the condenser is pretty standard come out liquid line dryer and then you're coming into what's known as the feed valve. So the feed valve is the very first phase change that happens in the system. So what is happening here is it's coming in as a high pressure subcooled liquid. This feed valve's job is to keep the flash tank level above or in a set range depending on what loads are on the machine and what conditions exist. So it is actually flashing off the first portion of refrigerant. So in a regular TXV situation, you know, you, you got to have like say an 80-20% flash off of the, uh, the TXV in a normal system, right? Well, what this allows to have happen is that, that two-phase mixture comes into the flash tank. The uh, extra subcooled uh, refrigerant liquid refrigerant falls to the bottom of the tank and then the the gas that flashed off just gets caught in the top end of the tank now what happens is once the compressor gets above 67 hertz on the on the vsd so all these are, are vsd driven or vfd it's just another term or terminology used variable speed versus variable frequency same exact thing once the compressor gets above 67 hertz it engages the economizer valve okay that is this valve down here labeled EV so you're coming out it's pulling the vapor gas off the top of the flash tank through a line and then back into the suction side of the compressor so and it will actually come in up to the close to the discharge right here something to be aware of on these compressors is this back half is actually the motor. The front section up uh, in the front is the actual compressor screws. So just visual representation of what it actually looks like in the field. Anyway, we do have a liquid level sensor monitoring how much refrigerant is in the flash tank. And again, it's, it's trying to maintain a certain set level. Usually it will be in the uh, mid to upper teens all the way up into about 30 to 40 percent uh, Depending on the charge and the load on the machine If it has a full charge and you can get a full load on it It usually doesn't have any trouble maintaining around 20 to 30 something percent with this uh, feed valve down at around at a full load, maybe 50-60%. Usually you could even get it below that and be less than 50% open at a, at a heavy load condition. Again, those, these, these do vary on the conditions. Anyway, you're coming into the flash tank. You have a liquid level monitor on the flash tank. Coming out of the flash tank on the bottom. Now these are physical representations. At the bottom of the flash tank is your drain valve. The drain valve is basically it's your final point of flash coming out of the, the tank. And this is where your, your true suction pressure will come from. And so you'll, you'll have a little more pressure drop coming off, out the other side of the drain valve. It is another EEV. Both of these are, are EEVs themselves. Anyway, coming through the drain valve, that is controlling how much refrigerant goes through the evaporator. What controls this feed valve is this liquid level monitor. Okay, it, that's its main job is just monitoring the liquid level and it is trying to maintain a set range uh, and it'll adjust the flow on this valve based off of this monitor. What controls the drain valve is the suction superheat coming back into the compressor. Most of the time, this will be set at around 10 degrees. I've seen some of them set to 8. I've seen some set to 12. So wherever it's set, anywhere from 8 to 12, that set point range is what is trying to control 
through this drain valve. So if it sees the superheat is increasing, going back to the compressor, it's going to open the drain valve more, allowing more flow and getting the superheat back down. And vice versa, if the superheat starts to drop too low, the drain valve will close down. Now keep in mind, every time this valve makes an adjustment, it's adjusting how this liquid level is reacting because it's, it's controlling how much, how much it's pulling out of the tank which then is going to correlate to how the feed valve responds as well. So just, just keep that in mind. This whole little network of the system here is all heavily tied together and very responsive. End of the day, it is super critical that your charge and everything be in really good condition, that the charge be there and that you not be running too low because you will start to see these valves really struggle. That's also another thing that these York YCIVs I, I see have a lot of issues is these valves when they begin to age they begin to, to have a lot of issues with sticking uh, I've got several chillers right now that the properties are actually just getting prepared to go ahead and, and change these valves out completely because they're not they're, they're getting to where they're not controlling quite right and the whole system will get out of balance if, if given long enough you can go in and exercise these valves through a manual control and they'll start to control better and, and, and you'll see them, you'll see the system balance like it's supposed to. So one of the things you'll see is, um, you know, you'll walk up to the unit and you know that the charge is, is good just from prior experience. You haven't had any leaks, but yet the drain valve will be at 100% trying to maintain, you know, a 12 degree superheat. That would be an immediate indicator that something's probably going wrong with the charge, you know, it, it, under normal conditions. But I, from experience, I've found you can go in and, and shut the system down and exercise these valves several times. Normally, in that, what, by the time they start having these issues, they'll be very noisy. You'll start hearing, you know, it'll be an excessive clicking noise. Um, so EEVs make a sound in general that's not uncommon for them. But what is uncommon is, is when they become a very, very audible. Most of the time, they're pretty quiet in their movement. A lot of times on these Yorks, they, they may not even make noise when they're brand new because the action is so smooth. But as they begin to wear down and break down, you will really start to see that these will, these will become more and more and more noisy over time. Just something to be aware of, something you can, you can fix by trying to exercise the valve You'll do that exercise on them, and I say that it's just moving it from 0% to 100%, and it will allow uh, the system to start running a lot more efficiently after you do that, and you'll see the valve. It may go from trying to do 100% open at full load. It may be able to do it at 50% after that. Uh, so just, again, something to be aware of. These valves in their normal travel only have a very limited range of travel and there's no reference signal going back to the controls to tell them what position the valve is actually in it's just a it's a time step it's, it's a stepper valve okay it's going to know that okay if i uh, do so many steps i'm supposed to be in in you know 50 percent position well the problem is when these valves begin to stick on their armatures the valve won't be as open as the system thinks it is so it'll think it's at 50% or 100% but in reality it's it's actually considerably different and so it, that's where you start to see these valves they'll get out of sync real bad and, and part of the exercising what it does is yes it's it actually allows you to the valve to calibrate you are doing a manual calibration on the valve but you'll notice that if you exercise them enough times you know it may be five or six times going from dead close to full open you'll begin to hear them get quieter and quieter with each time that they actuate. So and that's part of the goal that you're trying to achieve with doing this whole setup. Anyway, come through the drain valve. We're controlling the superheat. We go back to the suction, go through the compressor, back out the discharge, and off we go. Other than that, it's, it's, this is the, the, the standard cycle. What gets people the most is how this flash tank is actually operating and what this feed valve and drain valve is actually doing. Um, Something that I did not put in the drawing that I'll just make a mention of is you'll see some rubber hoses too a lot of times tying into the uh, end tubes of the condenser. Well, most when you see that, that's actually part of the coolant system. So these things use a what they call inhibitor. 
that flows through the VSD to help cool it through a little heat exchanger plate and it also is used to, to cool the electrical cabinet inside of the chiller panel. Uh, it'll have a little water coil and, and fans that blow across it and so York uses the condenser coil and the fans to help process out that heat through the inhibitor and it'll actually have a little inhibitor or water looking pump mounted on the system. So the rubber hoses you see and they'll have like a green fluid on this particular series flowing through them. That's what's it that's its function is to be a little electronics coolant so that it keeps the electrical cabinet and the VSD cool enough to operate so it doesn't overheat. One of the things about YCIV where they made an, an initial change, uh, York did, is at the evaporator between the YCIV and the YVAA. Okay, we're going to get to the inductor that's, that's part of the YVAA series equipment. So one of the first changes that really made the biggest impact for York on the YCIV, you had a standard direct expansion evaporator, okay? What that means is that the refrigerant comes through the end bell and the water flows through the side of the barrel. And so the water is on the outside of the tubes and the refrigerant's on the inside. So, and this is pretty common for most air cools. A lot of your air cools will have a direct expansion uh, style evaporator. Well, the YVAA, where it became different, is they switched it and they made it a flooded evaporator, would be the term for this. So in a flooded evaporator, the refrigerant dumps on the outside of the tubes and the water would be on the inside. Most of your centrifugals are going to be flooded evaporators. And so there's some additional problems that came in because from experience the YCIV has already had oil management issues and it's one of the the symptoms that they were dealing with and a huge part of oil management is making sure you keep enough velocity on the refrigerant and through the system you got to keep a high enough flow to in order to what little bit of oil the oil separator doesn't catch it can be returned back properly it becomes even harder to do that with a setup like this with a uh, with a, a flooded evaporator because what happens is your your two-phase refrigerant uh, comes in and it dumps into the bottom of the barrel and your suction line pulls off the top. Well, that really starts to allow a lot of oil to collect and build up under on the bottom side of the evaporator. What they did in order to fix this, this is a YVAA. You'll notice everything is identical, right, except for this right here, the ED, the adductor. So the adductor, its function and its job is to get oil returned out of the evaporator. That's its primary goal in life, is it wants to get that oil back uh, and just back out of the system, you know, trying to catch it out of the liquid line and also trying to pull it back out of the evaporator. Now, I'm not an expert on this, and I'm not going to pretend to be, but I will explain this as best that I understand it myself. Well, but basically what this boils down to is you will have a pipe coming on, on newer machines, and I'll, I'll explain this a little bit deeper in a second, but on, on any new machines on the YVAA, you're going to see a pipe coming off of the discharge line after the oil separator. And it will come across and it will land into the adductor block. Now the adductor block itself is the little uh, aluminum looking block. It will have a filter coming in. The filter should be on the liquid line side of things. And it will also have a, it'll have a discharge gas line. It will have come in from the liquid line. And then it will also have a line going to the suction line. What this is doing is the adductor through some interesting science and flow theory that again I, I i'm not even going to try to explain is it's able to create some additional velocity in the system and it's able to draw whatever oil is able to get into the rest of the system such as for example the evaporator and in the suction line and and i believe even some out of the liquid line and it's able to get that oil to return back to the suction side of the compressor and able, so that we can capture it and make sure that we don't have too much migration or, or even accumulation inside of the evaporator. From a service perspective, what you really have to care about on these, a lot of times guys will have issues with the, the adductor uh, fault or I think it's an adductor clog fault is, is very common. 
And a lot of times when you start to see that, you'll end up needing to replace the um, the 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 eductor filter or the liquid or the the filter coming into the eductor. What triggers that fault is the system. You have a thermistor right here on the eductor line prior to coming into the suction line, and what its main job is, it's comparing the since the the temperature of this line and it's looking at the evaporator saturation and it's adding 10 degrees and it wants these this temperature to be at or below that temperature so if this is got a saturation of say 45 degrees basically it wants this line 55 degrees or below if it exceeds that you'll get that that fault if it sees that for so many seconds you'll start to get that inductor at fault and one of the issues they had in the early machines before they put it on the outlet side of the oil separator was they were coming straight off of the discharge of the compressor and tying the discharge there into the adductor. Well, the problem that created was it, it was very oil latent refrigerant uh, trying to process through there. And it ended up creating a situation to where it was had so much oil going through the adductor that it allowed it to uh, it was it couldn't maintain the temperature that it was looking for and so the fix that you had to do was you had to remove it and cap it from where it came out of the compressor and it, you were supposed to and if you run into any of these machines with this problem you were supposed to move it to the uh, outlet side of the oil separator many times what you'll see if you walk up to a piece of equipment and you see that the adductor uh, thermistor it won't be mounted on the uh, on this line here coming into the uh, suction line it'll actually be mounted on the suction line itself well technically that is incorrect but that was the fix that you you that many people did because at that point it's it's the suction line is going to be within that you know that 10 degree range of the uh, of the saturation of, of the saturation temperature of the evaporator so as long as you had it on the suction line you, you would never trigger the fault and again what was causing the fault was the fact that we were having too much oil latent refrigerant get to the adductor from the discharge line so like I said the the fix for that was to move the adductor over to the discharge or the outlet side of the oil separator so that it can flow out and then go through the adductor port and back in so yeah, I mean, that was the major change that it did. The whole point of this entire setup was for oil management. Uh, that, that, was, that was the reason it was necessary. And like I said, they already had enough issues with the YCIV trying to ma manage the oil and the, uh, getting trapped elsewhere in the system. So whenever they switched to the uh, flooded evaporator, it was only going to make that problem significantly worse. So that's why they went to using the adductor setup, which is strictly to stop that from happening. And when it comes to the feed valve and the drain valve on a YVAA, all of those have the same same basic function. Uh, one of the things I think they also changed that I didn't mention was, uh, if I remember correctly, the economizer valve on the YVAA is not a solenoid valve like it is in the YVIC. It is actually another EEV uh, as well, uh, if, if, uh, if memory serves me right. Hope this helps. If it does, great. If you have any additional input or any other comments, please go ahead and add them into the comments of the video. Uh, uh, the most helpful one I will make sure to pin to the top so that everybody can see it and also discuss. Something else that I've also noticed recently is a lot of people ask for a lot of tech support and i don't mind at all right you know trying to help people you know through whatever problems or questions or anything that they're dealing with on a particular system it's really hard to do that through the youtube comments and things and i a lot of people ask for my whatsapp and or even my phone number i'm just going to tell you now one i don't have a whatsapp you know it's something i've looked into but it's just not something i've done and I, I'm, I'm not going to give out my phone number to talk to people and try to troubleshoot that way. It's just I, I don't have the time or anything for that. But what I can do and what I am okay doing is I do have a Facebook page. And my the link to that is in the description. And you can always go to that Facebook page and 
you can send me a message uh, through that page through you know Facebook Messenger, and I will be able to respond. I can help. We can share pictures. We can do whatever you want to do. Uh, from there, you know, we we can I can help you troubleshoot from that point, you know, and I, I so I highly encourage that if you need help with something or if you're looking for additional support or any questions or anything at all, feel free to go to my Facebook page, send me a send me a message through that page, and then we will be able to you know work together to troubleshoot a little bit further. Appreciate it. Thank y'all for getting to the end of the video and i'll see you on the next one remember to make time for your family make time for your spouse and we got a hot summer coming and uh it's it's always tough